my second visit to Dubai. My first visit was in 1976. There were three buildings, tall buildings, about 30 stories high. When you walked out the back door, you were in the sand. It certainly has changed. Of course, I've read a lot about Dubai, but uh, I, this place is, to me, very awesome. I just couldn't imagine that you, that it's grown the way it has and, and in such a very solid, permanent way. So I'm very pleased to be here today with you. Uh, also, uh, I'm very happy to be able to speak to an IPRA meeting, my first IPRA meeting, not as a speaker, but as a, an attendee, was in 1963. It was in uh, Berlin. I've since spoken at a couple of uh, uh, IPRA meetings. This is my third. I spoke at Shanghai, and then I spoke at uh, New Delhi a couple of years ago. Uh, at this point, I don't know whether I'm at the beginning of my career or at the end of the beginning of my career. Uh, but I do go to the office every day. Uh, clients uh, sometimes are very interested in what I have to say, uh, but I like being part of the action, uh, particularly uh, working with young people. And, uh, on that, uh, I would have a remark that it's especially interesting for me today to be working with the young people because most of them are females. You know, when I first started in this business, uh, the only women in public relations were in fashion, food, furnishings, or cosmetics. Today, more than 65% of all of the Burson Marstella people professionals uh, in more than 50 offices are female. Uh, at American universities that have public relations courses, up to 75% of the students are female. So this business has changed radically from a staffing standpoint from the time that I got in it. Uh, one thing I want to make clear today about my remarks is that I'm speaking only for myself. I'm not speaking for Burson Marstella. I'm not speaking for our parent company, WPP. These are some observations that I want to share with you that I have developed on my, on my own, and uh, uh, I take sole responsibility for all of them. And my first observation is this. Public relations is no long, longer a corporate stepchild. Most CEOs get it. In fact, some CEOs get it better than their public relations professionals. Uh, I think that CEOs increasingly, and I'm talking about around the world, uh, realize and appreciate the value of public relations, and also they value even more the need for a good reputation. And if they and when they have that kind of re regard for a good reputation, they invariably uh, are very uh, good supporters of their public relations programs. Uh, in fact, some P CEOs ascribe powers to us that we really don't have. Uh, on the other hand, there are other CEOs who blame communications for the management decisions that they made which they should not have made. Uh, the chief executive, the chief public relations officer is increasingly on the management and operating committees of their corporations. And they have, are increasingly are having higher titles in their organization. For example, uh, Herb Heitman, who was here on the previous panel, is an executive vice president uh, of Shell Oil Company, uh, which is very up high in the hierarchy. Uh, just to give you an idea of what that means, when I first started in the business, it was really unusual for a public relations, chief public relations officer to have a vice president title. They generally were director of public relations. Uh, 
a step below the vice presidential level. About in the 1970s, corporations started uh, giving the title vice president to a top PR person. In 1980s, they started giving the title of senior vice president. And now, as in the case of Shell, there are a number of very large corporations where the senior public relations communications officer is an executive vice president, which, and also, as I said earlier, they are members of the management committees of their companies, uh, which to me indicates a great deal of progress for us and also uh, a, a great deal of influence in the management of the organization. My second observation is that other management disciplines, like the general counsel, the chief marketing officer, management consultants, big four auditors, increasingly are inserting themselves into the public relations function. CEOs in both private and public sectors are now getting and accepting public relations advice from disciplines other than public relations. Public relations firms like Burson and Marsteller compete with management consultants, big four audit firms, law firms, human relations and personnel consultants, and on social media programs, sometimes with advertising agencies. Their focus, unlike public relations, is not always taking into account the need to serve the public interest. Stated and overriding goal in other disciplines, not that of protecting company reputations or preserving the good name. And I think that the big difference that we have over other people who are doing communicating in corporations is that part of our job is to do our best to see that our employer is serving the public interest. Public relations professionals can earn audible voice at management table by knowing both our trade and knowing the business of the firm that employs them, whether it's a corporation or whether it's a client company. Keeping informed in a timely manner on specific business issues is as important as knowing the basics of our profession. Uh, they must know the client vulnerabilities as well as they know the client strengths. They must be intuitive about the gremlin around the corner as they are with the demon that, is, that they are dealing with today. Now my third observation is, and this was referred to in Lord Bell's speech, uh, we are not striving hard enough to attract the best and the brightest to careers in public relations. Even though the collective hires include exceedingly bright young women and young men at the entry level or in the formative years of their careers, I question whether our entry level hire measures up to other professions, finance, law, management consulting, and even marketing. Are we sufficiently elitist in our hiring process? Also, the question of whether we are training new hires to be well-rounded counselors our bosses expect of upper level and senior people. As you know, most public relations firms today in a large, medium to large category have organized themselves into practices, uh, brand marketing, public affairs, healthcare, and so forth and so on. Uh, smaller, one or two, uh, smaller boutique agencies usually are specialists, uh, either in healthcare or technology or what have you. And the result of this organizational structure confines entry level people to a silo developing expertise in single defined areas. Uh, perhaps I'm suffering a generational syndrome, but the older I get, the more I'm aware of the symptoms. But over six decades in this business, the truly outstanding professionals I know 
and have worked with, without exception, had one quality. And that was that they were what we once called Renaissance people. Their thinking was all-encompassing. They were able to define real problems as quick as a flash. They were methodical and articulate when proposing a response. Dealing at the top of the management pyramid, they held their own even with the toughest, most demanding CEOs. And Lord Bell again referred to something like that during his remarks. And my hope is that colleges of communications strive to award degrees with a cachet equal in law or engineering or an MBA. The next one I know you're going to like. We underprice our services. Let me repeat that. We underprice our services. Public relations professionals employed in both public and private sectors and public relations firms and consultants. It's been that way since I entered this business more than six decades ago. And as a cartoon character Pogo once said many decades ago, I have met the enemy and he is us. For as long as I can remember, public relations professionals boasted that public relations is the least costly way to reach consumers and prospects and other targeted audience, in particular, less costly than advertising. Compare public relations fees with legal, management consulting, or investment banking fees. You'll find public relations comes dirt cheap. Even in the face of evidence that information disseminated in earned media or other non-paid media outlets is more credible and persuasive than paid media. My hope for the future would be that public relations services are priced on the basis of value, although I don't see that we'll ever get a million dollars for writing an opinion letter like an investment bank does. My further hope is that more CEOs who profess our company's reputation is our most valued asset will sign off on public relations budgets that protecting a most valuable asset deserves. And the reason I say that we are not charging enough for our services is, I think, one of the reasons we're not getting the very best people that we should get in our, into our field to do the job that needs doing. My fifth observation is that public relations professionals at both clients and counseling firms should work in closer harmony with public relations, communications, colleges, and educators. Also, the need to persuade business schools to include a course in the role of public relations and communications in their management function. Uh, at most of the business schools today, they may have one or two lectures in a two-year course uh, on how to use public relations, uh, but there's none that I know of that really works very hard at telling, at teaching uh, future executives uh, on how to use communications to solve their, uh, reach their company goals. My sixth observation is the need to broaden the public relations communications curriculum. One, there is no specific body of knowledge such as business, technology, finance, healthcare, public affairs. We don't have a place where we can go and get case history material uh, as readily as the law, lawyers can do, for example. Uh, when we do get case history material, most of it is anecdotal. I think that there should be some kind of established body of knowledge that we can refer to. Uh, the other thing I believe is that I think that students who are planning public relations careers should get more exposure to the social sciences that deal with behavior and opinion formation process. Uh, 
courses like behavioral psychology, cultural anthropology, sociology, economics, and political science, all of which have to do with influencing the behavior of people. It's my feeling that public relations, the definition of it, is it's an applied social science which deals with persuading people or motivating people to a course of action which our client wants them to take. And I think it's in our advantage to know something about how the opinion formation uh, is handled, processed by the brain. Uh, if we're going to be able to, to effectively do that, I think we have to know more of the psychology and also more about the cultures of the people that we're trying to reach. My seventh observation is that the chief public relations officer should be a direct report to the CEO, or in cases where that does not happen, he or she should be free and have frequent access to the CEO, who must always recognize that it's the CEO who is the company's primary and most authoritative spokesman. The CEO, I think, in every corporation should be the person who has final control over the messages that go out from that company. Uh, the S chief public relations officer, like the CEO, represents the totality of the business. And I don't think that the CEO can abdicate his or her role as a protector of the corporate reputation. My eighth observation is that both the public and private sector entities should strive to speak with a single voice despite the multiplicity of business units and geographies. Achieved only by delegating the global public relations responsibility to the chief public relations officer. In many companies, the world is divided into three sections, the Americas, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and then Pacific, Australia, and the Far East, Asia. Uh, and very frequently, the senior public relations officer has no functional control over the, the two parts of the business that where corporate headquarters is not located. Uh, my feeling is that uh, there should be functional responsibility, and that not only should it be stated, but also that the chief public relations officer has a dotted line relationship to everyone in the public relations staff, wherever they're located, and has control over their career path. And that means that at corporate headquarters, their bonuses have to be approved, their salary increases have to be approved, their transfers have to be approved. Uh, I think that's the best practice uh, today for the large global corporation. My ninth observation is that too many public relations professionals have failed to put digital and the internet in its proper context. It is not a new form of public relations. Digital, the internet, is the latest and most impactful in the continuum of mass information dissemination devices that started with Gutenberg's printing press and was followed by the telegraph, radio, motion pictures, uh, TV, uh, cable, and now we have digital. It's the most powerful device in disseminating information. It's also the most economical device. And I think that, as you heard other speakers say this morning, it has really changed public relations uh, from the standpoint that it gives us a new, very powerful tool to disseminate our messages. Uh, on the other hand, sort of irritates me whenever I read in some of the trade press, is digital going to replace public relations? Uh, people like us adapt to the media 
that we have available to us. I can remember back in the 50s, uh, having grown up myself on a newspaper before I went into public relations, how tough it was adapting to television. And those were the days, in the early days, we didn't have as many talk shows. Uh, talk shows didn't come in until maybe four or five or six years after television was introduced. But we finally learned to use television, and it has been a very effective device for us uh, for many, many years. But of course, I think today, uh, digital has even more impact than than the television does, except for the most highly rated shows like 60 Minutes in the United States. And my tenth observation is that public relations lacks an institutional memory, and I spoke a little bit about that before. Uh, in public relations, uh, we reinvent things uh, almost every day, things that if we had a better uh, resource of uh, programs and proposals and things like that, uh, that we could draw from them. Uh, there is also no comprehensive history of the practice of public relations. Uh, the closest that we have is a book that uh, a professor in the University of Wisconsin wrote about 15 years ago, and he does a history up to the Second World War, but we have nothing really that's been recorded about how public relations has changed and how it's developed since World War II. Uh, there's very little recognition of the people who really were the pioneers in, in establishing public relations as a professional discipline. The first public relations firm was started in 1900 in Boston. Uh, the second public relations firm was in the United States, started by a man named Ivy Lee, and he gained a lot of fame very early on because his client was the Rockefellers. And uh, the Rockefellers uh, were being sued for a monopoly uh, on oil uh, with Standard Oil Company, and, and John D. Rockefeller Jr. hired uh, Ivy Lee, who was then a financial writer for one of the New York newspapers, to advise on how to handle the press. And that launched uh, public relations pretty much as a commercial service in the United States uh, right before World War I. But names like uh, Edward L. Bernays, probably the best known name in public relations, Ivy Lee, Arthur W. Page, John Hill, Carl Beyer. Very few people around the world know who they are, uh, what they did in the public relations field to, to get it started and organized. Now my 11th observation is that public relations practitioners nowadays are overly concerned about the message and under-concerned about behavior which must accord with that message. Public relations, in my view, is a two-stage process. The first stage is embarking on a pattern of behavior, and the second stage is effectively communicating to target audiences the message that persuades audience, audiences to specific courses of action. Nowadays, too many messages are in the interest of the communicator rather than in the interest of the public. And when that's the case, you may feel, you may uh, influence people, some people, some of the time, but you will lose out in the long run. Uh, there's a rapper song in the States where they have the line, if you're going to walk the walk, you're going to have to talk the talk. And that, to me, is one of the most succinct definitions of public relations that I know. Another one is, do good and get credit for it. So behavior is really the basis on which 
companies establish a reputation, not communications. Communication is only a device to reflect that behavior and demonstrate that it's in the public interest. Uh, an 11th observation is that the media layoffs of editors and reporters is a strong plus for public relations. I think that the deadline, discipline, and writing skills and information processing abilities make them prime candidates for public relations hires. Uh, for about four decades, uh, news people have uh, not m migrated into public relations. And there were two reasons for that. One is they thought public relations was manipulative and the second reason, which I think was more important, is that in public relations salaries uh, at one point were considerably higher at the entry level and for the first five or eight years or ten years uh, and than newspaper salaries. So people who wanted to make more money didn't go from one public relations job to another. They usually went from a newspaper to a public relations firm. Uh, I can remember the day when, uh, as late as probably 1970, uh, most big, of the larger public relations firms would not hire a person unless they had uh, five years or so newspaper practice. Uh, since the arrival of digital about seven or eight years ago, uh, ten years ago, uh, We've increasingly hired at Burson Marcella more news people, newspaper, former newspaper people or press association people, television news people, than we probably hired in the previous 25 years. Uh, because basically, there, there are no, the, 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 trans, the traditional newspapers, uh, traditional media are not hiring very many new people, particularly on the editorial side. And so I think that's good for public relations because we're getting a bunch of good new people into the business. And my last observation is that the best is yet ahead for public relations. I'm very bullish on public relations. I'm bullish, bullish because we are learning more and more about individual and group behavior. And so much of the undeveloped world is transforming into the developed world. Growth in markets for products and services is almost guaranteed. Communications and transportation advances are shrinking the size of the world, and there's growth in all manner of relationships, and that's good for us. Developing relationships requires public relations input. Today's technologies devour content. We in public relations are producers of content. We're also specialists in developing and nurturing relationships. Uh, public relations, as I indicated before, is having an expanded role in the global corporation. Uh, they're maximizing diversity by more effective communications. And public relations is extending now into uh, into the customer service function. It's also uh, extending into training uh, in more and more com companies. Uh, and training people particularly who interface with the public. Uh, it, it's really surprising to me that when companies get into uh, serious crises that they don't make a special effort, usually, to inform their salespeople exactly what is happening day to day on the crisis. When these representatives go into their customers, the customers ask them what's happening. And so instead of getting the real story, they get a different story from every uh, salesperson. And there's a lot of confusion out in the market when the company is in, in, in really trouble. Uh, we had that situation when AIG got into trouble about three years ago when the financial collapse. And one of the first things that we did was we instituted uh, a 
twice a day report to every salesperson uh, in that company who dealt with the public, uh, who dealt with customers. Uh, all in all, I think demand will raise the market value of public relations in time, but I think we have got to do something to try to get our bosses and our clients to uh, realize that uh, their expenditures today on public relations is very minimal compared to what they spend in the marketing place. Uh, as a final note, I want to say to you that I have been to literally hundreds of these kinds of meetings, and I don't think I've ever been to one where the first day started out as meaningful with the content as today's meeting. And I congratulate the committee that put the program together because it was a really a very uh, day of uh, really solid information, good discussion, and uh, I congratulate those people who were responsible for it. Thank you very much.